the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure, sitting in for Jim Flink. Afghans head to the polls this weekend in the second round of their presidential election. It's slated to be the first democratic transition in Afghanistan's history, and the race is down to two candidates. Abdullah Abdullah is the country's former foreign minister and came in second in the country's last presidential election in 2009. He won the first round of the election in the beginning of April and is originally from the capital, Kabul. His opponent is Ashraf Ghani, Afghanistan's former finance minister. He's from Logar in the eastern part of the country. Today on Global Journalist, we'll look at the Afghan election and what the results may mean for the country's development. Joining us are Patricia Gossman, a senior researcher on Afghanistan at Human Rights Watch in Brussels, Masume Torfe, a former director of strategic communication at the UN Assistance Mission for Afghanistan, who's now a researcher at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Frude Bezan, a correspondent for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, based in Kabul. Welcome to you all. Thanks for having us. Thank uh, you. Well, it's wonderful to have you. My first question is, uh, generally speaking, what, what is the significance of these elections, uh, Frude? Uh, what does it mean for Afghanis? What does it mean for the various international uh, folks that have been there? Well, it's a huge election, and um, you mentioned yourself, it's going to be the first democratic transition of power in the country's history. Um, the next president is going to have monumental challenges ahead of him. Um, foremost, he needs to repair uh, relations with the United States, which have soured considerably um, under outgoing President Hamid Karzai. Um, there's, a, there's a huge economic and uh, military transition that's going on, uh, which is going to be very important as Afghanistan tries to stay, stand up on its two feet. Good. Patricia, how do you see things? Well, as Ruth said, this is an enormously important year. It's the transition year. It's almost become a cliche in Afghanistan that you talk about 2014 um, with some trepidation because of a, the withdrawal of international forces and the fear that this may also spell a, a decline in international interest in Afghanistan at a very critical time when the insurgency remains quite strong, when the government's going to face a lot of challenges in terms of its internal reform as well as uh, security for its citizens across the country. Women's rights also uh, remain a challenge. So I think it'd be, it's fair to say this is one of the most critical years Afghanistan's going to face. And Masume Torfe, could you tell us just a little bit about these two candidates? Uh, what are, what's their background? What are their positions? How is each likely to rule if elected? Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. But first, I was going to add to that list that uh, uh, the two others uh, made to you. It's also the first no Karzai election, which is quite good. And it's the first uh, good participation of women in the uh, election process. Um, and it's the first time that it's been uh, Afghan-led and Afghan-managed almost uh, entirely, because this time they really put their feet down and said, uh, no interference, and I think the international community got the message and stayed away. It gave support, but it didn't actually politically interfere at all. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's happening at a time when there is a huge uh, threat uh, from the Taliban, uh, and uh, it's unfortunately coinciding with a time when uh, Mosul in Iraq is being taken over by ISIS. Uh, and, and it uh, kind of strengthens the Taliban in that sense, although not directly related. So uh, security uh, remains a very, very big challenge, uh, as do corruption and uh, drugs uh, still remain after 13 years of international community being in Afghanistan. Um, as for the two candidates, uh, I mean, uh, they... Um, um, I have, for the past uh, kind of 20 years, I've worked very directly and indirectly with them, both as a journalist and as, as, a, as a UN staff member. I know them uh, very well. I have huge respect for both of them. Uh, but I, I feel that uh, uh, they are not really representing anything new uh, for the people of Afghanistan uh, because uh, um, not so much of uh, their own policies, uh, about which we've heard very little, 
but much more because of the teams that they are forming. We are seeing very much uh, the same sort of faces that we have seen in Afghanistan for the past 30 years. Uh, and we, uh, like, uh, like many Afghan uh, uh, people, uh, associate them uh, with the years of uh, war and warlordism and strong men. Uh, so um, I think uh, um, uh, the two don't come across as being totally uh, uh, presenting something very new to the population who's braving the uh, threat of the Taliban. Fruit Bezan, do you see things the same way? Well, the thing is that both of these candidates, um, they have very different personal narratives. Um, one is an, a traditional Afghan politician who has spent most of his life in Afghanistan. And then we have Ashraf Ghani, a Western educated technocrat, um, who has been outside of Afghanistan for a significant amount of time. Um, they, there are similarities between the candidates on the surface. Both want to sign the bilateral security agreement with the United States. Um, and both want better relations uh, with the USA. Uh, but there are deep differences that I just mentioned. Um, the fact that uh, they come from such uh, profoundly different backgrounds. Um, but at the same time, um, as was just mentioned, um, warlords, former warlords and strongmen are a political reality in Afghanistan. And no matter who comes into power, I think what we're going to see is the status quo. Good. And uh, Patricia Gossman, the Independent Election Commission has accused both candidates of stirring ethnic tensions uh, during the campaign. What effect is that likely to have in the aftermath? It's hard to say, but of course that's one of the underlying tensions in Afghanistan. Um, as my, my colleagues on the show have mentioned, uh, both camps have courted certain strong men, former warlords. Uh, other others who have not exactly savory pasts, and ethnic tensions clearly were a factor in the conflict from the very outset. And it would be—it's a, a very dangerous game to play. And I think, while the election is one thing, and we were very pleased to see the turnout in the first round of the election, elections are really the starting point, not the end point. So the critical thing is going to be what happens in the immediate aftermath. If the result is accepted and then whether whoever becomes president is really going to be in a position to carry out the kind of reforms that are necessary and not rely on his particular uh, you know, supporters, the alliances he has forged, that kind of thing, which the kind of political expediency that we've seen in the last 12, 13 years, which has meant that there hasn't been the kind of genuine reform that Afghanistan needs. Good. And my understanding is Abdullah. Abdullah is half Tajik, half Pashto, the largest ethnic group, but is viewed within Afghanistan as Tajik. Uh, Ashraf Ghani is a Pashtun from the eastern part of the country, uh, which is the group that has traditionally ruled there. How does that, how does that play out in the election? Uh, what significance is it likely to have for the future of peace in the country, Fruit? Well, we do know that Afghans vote along ethnic lines, and uh, the evidence that we've seen so far in this election points to that again. Um, um, the problem for Abdullah is that because he is seen as a Tajik, um, a lot of observers said that he wouldn't be able to court uh, Pashtun votes. But uh, what Abdullah has done is that he has courted a lot of uh, Pashtun leaders um, in the name of uh, Zalmay Rasul, um, Ustad Sayaf, uh, and a few others um, that might give him the numbers to actually win. Um, but the, what I was going to say is that um, ethnicity um, is a problem because uh, right now Abdullah's team, they have courted mainly Hazar votes and Tajik votes. And what Ashraf Ghani has done, he has courted mainly Pashtun and Uzbek votes. So that has uh, deeply divided the country. And uh, that could be a concern going forward. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Today we're talking about the Afghan election and what the results may mean for the country's development. Joining us are Patricia Gossman, a senior researcher on Afghanistan at Human Rights Watch in Brussels, Masume Torfe, a research associate at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and the former director of strategic communication at the UN Assistance Mission for Afghanistan, and Fruit Bezan, a correspondent 
for RFERL, based in Kabul. You can listen to this and other full episodes of Global Journalist on our website. That's globaljournalist.org. For more Global Journalist content, you can like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter, at Global Journ. Masume, I wanted to go back to something you had mentioned, and that was the role of women uh, in the first round of elections here. What, uh, what is likely to change for women in Afghanistan after this election, if anything? Um, well, um, women um, participated uh, um, in, in more numbers than they had done before. Uh, and we see that uh, because uh, women's groups have been strengthened relatively uh, during, especially in the past two years, we see them coming to the fore and, and influencing politicians. Therefore, we have both Dr. Ghani and Dr. Abdullah stressing on their policies for women. Uh, in fact, uh, Dr. Ghani made lots and lots of promises to women. Uh, he said, uh, you know, he's going to build health care centers right across the country for women. He's going to build modern universities for women, exclusively for women. He made lots of promises. So has Dr. Abdullah. Dr. Abdullah has uh, two very strong women uh, uh, in his team. He has Fauzia Kufi, uh, who's a member of parliament, but has been a strong woman activist for the past, uh, uh, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, and uh, he also has Habiba Sarabi, who's uh, um, uh, Hazara uh, and has been a governor in Bamiyan and has always held high-ranking positions, such as the uh, Ministry of Women. Uh, so, I mean, I think they are paying some attention uh, to the um, policies with regards women. Uh, but at the same time, again, I get terribly concerned because when you have a leadership team which is composed mainly of warlords, uh, and in the case of Dr. Ghani, when you have a strong Pashtun tribal uh, uh, elders following you and being the only source of loyalty and, and votes for you, that means that they come into contrast and contradiction with women's rights uh, because uh, they have a much more traditional views of what women's roles should be and where women should be. So we see this continuing contrast in Afghanistan. Nevertheless, we do see women and women's groups making their way, making their voices heard. And I was very uh, impressed when I was in Afghanistan. I spoke to many, many women, of course, as you can imagine, uh, many women activists as well. And when I said to them, are you concerned about the return of the Taliban? Most of them uh, would turn back to you and say, even though this might be symbolic, but they'd say to you, we will never let them come back, which is quite a strong stance from Afghan women uh, who have been, uh, you know, so uh, abused uh, throughout uh, uh, the past uh, 30 years. Uh, Fruit Bezan, I wanted to ask you about the, the Taliban now. Uh, how significant is their role going to be uh, within the country going forward? How great is the government's control going to be over the countryside? Uh, can you give us a, a picture of what it's like traveling around Afghanistan? Well, there's no doubt that the Taliban poses a significant threat. Um, but the, the good thing that we see is that the Afghan security forces, the fledgling forces, uh, they're improving all the time. Um, even though they suffer from numerous issues, such as desertion, uh, lack of weapons, illiteracy, um, but as the first round of the election showed, um, they managed to stand on, on their own feet and they managed to keep security, um, especially in Kabul. Uh, I think going forward, what we're going to see is that um, Afghan security forces will be able to uh, control and secure uh, many of the urban centers and uh, the capitals of the provinces. But I think large areas of the countryside, the rural areas, are going to be controlled by the Taliban and other insurgents. And Patricia Gossman, President Obama has said he plans to draw down the U.S. troop presence in Afghanistan from 32,000 to 9,800 next year and then withdraw completely by 2016. What effect is this likely to have on the security environment there? Well, it's certainly a, a cause for concern um, among Afghans, but I think it, equally important is a concern about the, the drawdown, if you will, of, of funds. The Afghan government at this point will have a hard time keeping its military um, and many other 
and the security forces in general funded and operating without sufficient funds. So this is something that's really a cause for concern if it's not, that if, if there isn't a way to address that very within this year. But I wanted to go back to the question about women um, and point out that while, of course, women are very concerned about any possible Taliban advances um, in some parts of the country, we are seeing that Taliban have, as, as Prude pointed out, gained control of districts or some areas outside um, the urban centers. But the threat to women doesn't come just from the Taliban. In the past couple of years, we have seen a pushback on gains made by women uh, in vital areas of the law, uh, for coming from the parliament, coming from other political leaders in, in Kabul, not just from the Taliban. And we're, I think it's something the international community has to watch very carefully. Certainly under President Karzai, there was a, a tendency to let some of these, uh, this backsliding happen. Whether uh, Dr. Abdullah or Ashraf Ghani will be able to stand up to those, including people in their own camps who support these kind of setbacks against women or have not been fully supportive, that, that remains to be seen. And that's going to be a critical uh, test in the next few months after this president takes office. And you raised the issue of development aid and cuts in humanitarian aid. The U.S. Congress uh, recently halved the appropriation for Afghanistan aid this year. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns about how well that aid has been spent. Transparency International uh, ranks Afghanistan dead last in the world in its Corruption Perceptions Index. Uh, Masume Torfe, how significant an impact has the development aid, humanitarian aid that has been spent in Afghanistan over the last 13 years? How big an um, impact has it had? Well, I mean, uh, the, the impact, uh, as far as we can see, uh, uh, has, uh, has really been negligent. Uh, there have been uh, uh, great improvements in certain sectors, uh, but uh, there, uh, there has been uh, um, uh, not enough attention paid to uh, a lot of sectors that, that could have done which, with much more attention such as women's issues that uh, Patricia referred to, and I totally agree with the things that she said, such as education. I mean, they boast a lot about uh, uh, um, a lot more girls going to school. Yes, there are more going to school, but uh, the education uh, system has not received the attention it needed to. Uh, and I think that, uh, uh, again, going back to the, uh, to the uh, candidates uh, that are there, uh, um, it will depend very much on their policies. And uh, if, if they would have, uh, and I'm going to stress this time and again, if they would have a number, uh, and each seems to have about four or five of these warlords or, or, or strong men in their teams, then the international community is going to be uh, um, uh, much more concerned if they're not going to have uh, appropriate policies uh, for economic development, for women's development, uh, and uh, for, uh, for improved education, international community is going to be concerned if corruption is not going to be tackled properly as it has not been done in the past 13 years, uh, 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 then they are going to be uh, very cautious about the amounts of money they give to the government. And don't forget, uh, the, there's going to be much uh, fewer, uh, much less of an international presence. So international donors are not going to be so... Uh, trusting of uh, what is happening in Afghanistan. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're discussing the Afghan election and what the results may mean for the country's development. Joining us are Patricia Gosman, a senior researcher on Afghanistan at Human Rights Watch in Brussels, Masume Torfe, a research associate at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and the former director of strategic communication at the UN Assistance Mission for Afghanistan, and Fruud Bezan, a correspondent for RFERL based in Kabul. I wanted to follow up on Masume's point that the billions of dollars in humanitarian and development assistance money that's been spent in Afghanistan has had a negligible impact. Is that the way, is that, the way that you see things as well? Well, I, I think many Afghans see that um, the international presence here was a golden opportunity for the country. Um, in 2001, um, there was nothing in the country. The infrastructure was destroyed. Healthcare system was uh, non-existent. And although there have been improvements in a lot of sectors, uh, which were just mentioned, I think many see it as a lost opportunity. And uh, there, there's also anger from many Afghans that a lot of the, the billions that the U.S. has spent 
on infrastructure projects um, that the U.S. hasn't actually completed those. Um, there's so many. I, I'm right now in uh, in central Kabul, and I was passing today past the defense ministry, and um, Afghanistan. Um, well, the U.S. is going to build Afghanistan its own uh, so-called Pentagon. Um, and this project has, um, you know, they've spent almost uh, $200 million on this project. Um, and they only needed a little bit of more just to finish the project, but they didn't. Uh, they pulled the plug and now it's a stranded building and it's a symbol of the huge waste in this country. Uh, Jason, can I just add sure, a few go things ahead. as well there? Um, you know, I mean, the international community, I think, has failed to give Afghanistan a vibrant security plan. Uh, it has uh, failed even to tackle properly human rights issues about which Patricia can speak much more. Um, uh, um, as far as drugs problem is concerned, the, the United Nations Office for Drug Control says there has been 36% rise in 2014. Uh, uh, and, uh, and there's 209,000 hectares of land under cultivation. Uh, uh, economic growth has been reasonable uh, as far as World Bank is concerned, but it's going to be extremely difficult to sustain. Uh, about 36 to 40 percent of people live in poverty. So you can see that uh, the, the, the money that has come into Afghanistan has really gone a lot to waste. It hasn't been focused properly on issues that matter to Afghan people. Unemployment is still uh, a big issue. Uh, and, and, and people are really feeling uh, um, uh, um, the, the brunt of all these problems. You know, I mean, they are unemployed, they're living in poverty, they're facing uh, 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 Taliban attacks uh, day in and day out. And, and it's, 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 it's really been too much, and that is why they attended so well in the elections, but because they're hoping for some change. And if no change is going to be in the political narrative, it's going to be very... Uh, um, uh, unfortunate for the people of Afghanistan. And if I could add to that, yeah. Sorry. Patricia, go ahead, add to that, please. Um, I think we need to understand why there is this uh, real impunity for, uh, for really what's rampant corruption. And it has to do with the way things really started from after 2001, which was a policy of supporting warlords, strongmen, anyone believed strong enough to, to keep the Taliban at bay and Al-Qaeda. And therefore, the international community, and typically the U.S., really turned and looked the other way when it came to abuses. The people who are now in power, including many of these strongmen and warlords, were people befriended in the fight against the Taliban. And they, were, they made a lot of money in this last you know, 12 years of, of, uh, since the, the Reconstruction began. And nobody has ever been held to account, for, not for corruption, not for drugs, not for human rights abuses. And many of the people that have been very closely aligned with the U.S. in its fight against the Taliban include people who've committed, you know, horrendous human rights abuses. So we are now at a stage where, yes, the Afghan people want to see a change because they have lived with a very corrupt state, of a state where they know there are human rights abusers. And that's why I think you did see, um, as was pointed out, that people turn out for the election. But it was a, a policy of embracing short-term strategies to try to hold back the insurgency and not really addressing the fundamental institutional reforms that were necessary. And yet if that insurgency still exists, is it, is it possible at this point now for there to be a shift in those types of policies, or are we likely to see them to continue? Patricia? I think we have to understand that the insurgency gained ground you know, directly as a, as a result of these, this abusive behavior, when people felt they had no stake in the government, they saw that the judicial system didn't work, it was corrupt, that was a factor in driving people to support the Taliban again. When they found that governance in their districts was so uh, abusive, that gives support to the, to the insurgency. So in the end, it's the government's going to have to take responsibility for addressing fundamental grievances that feed this conflict. There has to be a political solution or it will not end. And Frud, let me ask you uh, as well about the role of Afghanistan's neighbors in this election. Uh, has, have you seen evidence of Iranian influence, of Pakistani influence over different factions or different groups there? We saw the other day um, 
the former head of the ISI in Pakistan um, coming out and saying that he prefers uh, one candidate over the other. Um, and a lot of Afghans were scared about that um, but or, and concerned about that. But I think in general, um, Afghanistan's neighbors, um, they've had a past of meddling in Afghanistan. And I think with the drawdown, and especially the 2016 um, deadline uh, to pull most of the American troops out, I think we're going to see neighbors starting to exert the influence um, through proxies. And um, especially Pakistan has kept uh, many of those proxies that it used in the 90s during the Civil War um, still in its grasp. Um, you know, we're talking about the Taliban, we're talking about the Haqqani network, and we're talking about other surging groups. So there is a big likelihood that uh, the neighbors, uh, they are going to um, come and trying to exert their influence in Afghanistan. And Masume Torfe, we have just about a minute left here. We've heard many reasons to be pessimistic about the future of Afghanistan here. What are some reasons to be optimistic? Um, well, many people say that uh, uh, there, there are no people other than these warlords on the scene, so you, this is a reality in Afghanistan. I totally disagree with that, because although men, there are many of these warlords or people who've been involved in wars, but you also have a very vibrant, a very intelligent, a very intellectual uh, young generation uh, uh, of Afghans uh, who have mainly been uh, educated abroad or uh, inside, but they have a completely different outlook to Afghanistan. Uh, they have had the pain of the war years, but they don't have the grudges and they don't have uh, uh, the enmities. And therefore, uh, these you can see these people active in civil society groups, in women's groups, in youth groups, in new political parties that are taking shape. And these are the hopes for future of Afghanistan. And I wish that the two candidates had included uh, more of these uh, faces in their leadership teams rather than the warlords that they've gone for. But these, uh, they, they, these people are growing and they are changing the political narrative, and that's a big hope for Afghanistan. But there is a very negative side as well, if I may, and that is revival of extremism and this growing insurgency, especially with the release of so many political prisoners, the five last ones of which caused controversy. But President Karzai, over the past uh, few years, for four or five years, has released something like 600, uh, 650 uh, Taliban prisoners, many of which uh, uh, have been uh, the extremists. And that is, that is the danger that uh, the hope of Afghanistan faces. That's where we're going to have to leave it for today. Uh, Global Journalist is a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our thanks to our guests, Patricia Ghostman, Masume Torfe, and Fru Bezan. Our executive producer is Casey Morell, with assistance from Cameron Dodd, Batul Hassan, and Caleb O'Brien. Travis McMillan from the Reynolds Journalism Institute is our technical director, and Pat Akers of KBIA is our audio engineer. Join us again next time for another edition of Global Journalist. For Jim Flink, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for listening.